Well, thank you for um, uh, first thanks to Keith and Stephanie and Lifespan IO for inviting me to this uh, conference. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks to all of you for sitting here and listening to me. I'll try to keep it short so we can go to lunch. Um, so uh, my uh, research really focuses on understanding the molecular basis of, of the phenotypes that we develop as we get old. So why do we develop graying of hair? Why do we get facial wrinkles? Why do we get changes in subcutaneous fat, uh, pigmentation changes in the skin? And, um, and, and why, do we, uh, why do we have to die? So um, this is the dark start of, uh, of, the, of this talk. But obviously there are many other phenotypes and these uh, few phenotypes that I mentioned. So um, graying of hair is, is, is the most prevalent phenotype in individuals as they get older. So 99% of everybody will develop graying of hair. So graying of hair is actually, in my opinion, a quite good uh, biomarker of aging if we wanted to to uh, intervene in the aging process, maybe that could be a biomarker. But there are other features. Cancer, about 40% of everybody will develop some type of cancer. And, uh, I've been particularly interested in brain aging and understanding uh, why, why the brain ages, why do, do we develop dementia, and so that occurs in between 10 and 20% of everybody. So these are some of the phenotypes, and we basically got that by downloading PubMed, and then we did some uh, text analysis, but we are now more recently looked at other uh, other sources of of, uh, of, um, of data, and so one of those sources is with healthcare records, and this is one of the oldest uh, healthcare records uh, in existence. This is uh, from ancient Egypt, describing tumors and uh, broken bones in individuals, as we can all uh, read, of course. Um, but more recently, we also we have gotten uh, uh, some potentially higher quality data than these uh, hieroglyphs. We have access to 33 million pathology reports. So these are text-based descriptions of what a pathologist sees when he looks into the microscope. And so we've been able to, to analyze this. So, so basically, we can build a giant matrix where we have uh, features along um, in, the, in the columns here, and then whether or not the features present in, in that particular pathology report. And then we have 33 million reports. And so when you do that, you can then look at how the different terms are associated with each other. So this is um, a, um, a um, TSNE, so a type of um, way to look at how different terms associate with each other. And uh, the, 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 um, the hue of the dots of the terms uh, reflects the age. So age is not part of the analysis, but we label it afterwards with age. And we can see that sort of all the young, young terms appear to associate in the middle, and then you have these red. So, so with, with age, you get all these you get changes that are not unidirectional, right? They sort of explode from a center where there's order, and then you get disorder as we age. We can also do another type of dimensionality reduction. This is a PCA. So here we have averaged each uh, age point. So this is age zero, this is age 100. Uh, and then we simply see how do the different ages fall out. And as you can see, there's a really a nice progression as we age along principal component one. It sort of dips here and then you get a, a, an effect from principal component two. So maybe this effect here could be more developmental. And this effect here is more sort of aging changes. And you can see that reflected here. So you have this developmental effect and then not, nothing much happens in, in this component and then when you get very old, stuff happens. Whereas principal component two, and you see that increases from 20 and then just grows like this. And because we saw uh, increases, particularly around 40, uh, 50 years, we thought that maybe menopause could, could be um, driving some of these changes. So we split it up into um, 
different sexes and looking at females uh, and males. And what's potentially quite interesting is so if you look at uh, females, you have uh, a long principal component one, you have a very strong dual mental effect. And then you have aging that sort of starts at this and then it drives up around along this principal component two. And that aging effect actually starts, so the lowest point is actually at age 19 for, uh, for the females, suggesting that that aging really starts actually at that time point and then it sort of slowly progresses. For males it's a little bit different, so you have a slower progression initially, but then when aging uh, sort of finally happens, and that is maybe around year 40, then it sort of really goes downhill. So uh, that's, uh, I mean, good news and bad news for everybody, I guess. Um, but that's how it is. We can also look at individual tissues. So here we can see how does uh, tissue changes occur with age uh, using various uh, analyses. And we can uh, actually look at the uh, Cox uh, hazards for individual terms. So for all the thousands of terms, we can see how does individual terms uh, associate with the mortality of individuals because we also have death records of the individuals. So we can, we actually have, you know, thousands of biomarkers of aging uh, here. We can predict age from, from terms. This is using deep learning. And it's not, I mean, it's not great. It's a mean absolute error of seven point what does it say? 7.6 um, years, so it's not, it's not great, but it's also not terrible. Uh, to sort of improve this, we, we did uh, something called topic modeling, which is to see how the different uh, terms associate in different topics, and then seeing how topics contributes to, to aging. And so some of the topics that are most strongly predictive of aging is, is some topics we have here, one of them is what we term pulmonary aging, which we can see a list of features here. And so you see fibrosis and these things, which is maybe not surprising, okay? So you, you get a lot of stuff that we already know, uh, but you get it in a sort of uh, unbiased way. So we thought, how can we translate this into something more interventional? So to do this, we, we um, we had our pathology register uh, uh, data, and then we we could then combine this with another data source. So here we, we again went back to PubMed, we downloaded PubMed again, and then we looked at terms that were associated with with, uh, with, with lung aging um, in the PubMed abstracts. But because PubMed extracts contain all kinds of stuff, including genes and drugs, we can look at also which drugs associates with aging, which means that we can identify molecules and drugs that may impact lung aging. And so we did this. Um, we combined it also with the PubChem database, so it, it's a little bit more extensive than this, but uh, we identify some compounds. One of them is this nintendanib, which um, actually appears to reduce cellular senescence when, when you measure, when we treat it. Uh, and we looked at the effect of this drug in senescent fibroblasts, which reduced collagen metabolism, wound healing, which are two processes that are probably involved in, in lung fibrosis, and then it extended lifespan in, in Drosophila, so in fruit flies. So this is the basic overview of the study, which um, which you can find on, on a bioarchive paper. And actually this data, the pathome, the human pathome, is um, available on pathoh.com. So it's a free resource. It's still being built, but all of the data is there. Okay. So this is one of the ways we're trying to understand aging and develop interventions. Another way is to look at actual tissues. So can we predict age from, from um, tissue samples? So we um, used a convolutional neural net on, on uh, skin biopsies from individuals. We, we had uh, a relatively small sample size, only 200 skin samples, and then we looked for whether or not we could 
predict age from these samples, but variation was very high actually, so, so we're not able to get a good predict out of this. Uh, so, um, we're attempting to salvage this uh, project. And so one thing that we looked, we considered was then looking at nuclear morphology. So we know that nuclear morphology changes with age. It also changes if you have premature aging. This is a Hodgkin Guilford progeria patient, uh, which has a, a change in the nuclear envelope. So we know nucleus, nuclear morphology changes with age. So perhaps we could find senescent cells in the tissues based on nuclear morphology. And so um, we, um, we um, generated some data in the lab looking at repetitive senescence and ionizing radiation induced senescence in fibroblasts. And then we looked at different morphological features. We developed a neural network that can take out the nuclei and then we can see how the different features change. And so these are some of the features. They, they become enlarger, the, the nuclei. They become a little bit more convoluted when they become senescent. And then they actually also become more elongated, which is something that we don't particularly understand, but we see this quite consistently. Um, and so we then trained a neural network to predict senescent cells based solely on their nuclear morphology. And this worked really well, so we get a very, very high accuracy in the predictor. Um, we get good correlation with known senescent markers. And what's more important is that we can actually do normalization so we can remove the background. So, so we cut out these small pieces of the nuclei and then we can remove the background of the nuclei. We can size normalize them. And then we can remove the completely remove the internal part of the nuclei and then only look at the outline. And we still get a very, very strong uh, new uh, predictor of senescence. And so we can use this in, in fibroblasts from prematurely aged patients and they are predicted to be much older. We can do it in, in astrocytes that have been irradiated, they're predicted to be older. It also works in neurons. So these are human cell lines, but then we can also go into tissues because from tissues it's, it's difficult to identify cells, but it's very easy to identify nuclei. So this is in, uh, in liver tissues from mice. We have a neural network that picks up the, the nuclei and then we can ro uh, run our senescence predictor on the nuclei. And we see that, uh, again, aspect ratio increases with age. So nuclei become more elongated with age. I think this, uh, I don't know how, why that happens, but it happens. Um, and you get an increase in both predicted repetitive senescence and ionizing radiation induced senescence. Okay, and so now we can go back to the 200 samples we had originally, and then we could predict um, senescence in those samples and look at how that associates with health outcomes. And so we see that um, uh, repetitive senescence increases with age. Um, we don't see a significant increase in ionizing radiation induced senescence, but uh, we do see a trend. Um, and because we have healthcare records for all these individuals, then we can also ask our people that have uh, a lot of senescence, are they more unhealthy? Is it, are the people that have less senescence, are they more healthy? That was our uh, initial hypothesis. But what was really surprising was that the by far strongest signal was actually neoplasms and it was, it was inverse. So it was the people that were down here that had very little senescence, so very little tendency to induce senescence, had a much greater risk of developing cancer. So this again supports the idea that, that senescence is a, is a strong barrier uh, to cancer. And uh, this was published uh, half a year ago about. And we've now applied this to a larger data set in um, uh, uh, biopsies from, uh, from the t uh, coma tissue bank where we looked at whether or not uh, this predicted senescence can, can predict uh, the development of breast cancer. And uh, what we see here is that uh, it's actually, uh, um, so if you look at, um, so if you look for example at uh, ionizing radiation induced senescence, 
and combine this with the uh, the commonly used Gale score, you get a very very strong predictor of the risk of developing future cancer. And so this is very important because, so in the U.S., for example, there's more than a million biopsies taken every year, and the majority of those biopsies actually don't show cancer. And um, now we can actually risk stratify all of these uh, patients that are getting these uh, these cancer biopsies. Okay. So healthcare records uh, can be beneficial. So um, we also have access to uh, to other types of healthcare registries. So this is the um, um, this is the the um, death registry in Denmark, based on five million people. We can this is the survival curve of the Danish um, population, basically. But we can combine this with um, with the um, prescription database. So what what are doctors prescribing to these patients, and then we can identify compounds that are uh, associated with longevity and compounds that are associated with, with shorter lifespan. So each of these um, lines are a group of individuals that have been prescribed the same compound. And so you can see that there is uh, quite a large variation there. So one of the first things we looked for uh, was uh, metformin. And we found that um, if you look at, at all ages, and um, looked at the effect of metformin. For everybody, we actually we see a lifespan shortening in general. But if you only look at individuals that are 70, so 70 years older, you get diagnosed with diabetes and then you get metformin, and then we actually do see this, there's a lifespan positive effect the first 10 years, and then there's crossover in the survival. And I think this is because individuals that get metformin have diabetes. So there's an underlying confounding uh, disease that might uh, impact this also. So uh, we identified some compounds that had uh, a lifespan extending property and we call that compound X, Y, and C. And these uh, three compounds, because they're FDA approved, they are obviously very um, interesting because they can immediately be tested in clinical trials to see if we can actually impact aging. And this is uh, the basis of, of, um, of the first uh, IPNFT, I think, in the world, which, uh, which was um, uh, driven by this really amazing Vita Dao community that, that taught, told us about earlier. And the idea was that that we could then test some of these compounds to find, uh, explore whether or not they could impact a human lifespan. And so we did this, we, we, we test this in, um, in various models, so in cell lines, and we would also test them in flies. And so the setup in the cell lines is that we take the cells, we seat them in, in plates, we irradiate them to induce senescence, and then we treat with the drugs, and then we see we run our senescence predictor to see how that impacts senescence and survival. And then we can validate using various other markers. And so we've done this in a really uh, large amount of different uh, uh, cell types. We've also tested actually more than the initial three uh, compounds. And we found uh, three drugs that uh, significantly reduces predicted senescence, X, Z, and J5. Um, so that's that's really exciting, and we can uh, also uh, test drug combinations. And here we can see that if you combine uh, X and Z, uh, you see a, a quite uh, strong change from. So the the dark ones are non-senescent, and the red ones are senescent cells. So there's a dose-dependent decrease in senescent cells. This is also the case with J and X. Uh, but not so much with JN said. So the, the point is here that we have FDA-approved drugs that we, uh, that we can see associated with lifespan uh, increase. We can see in um, cell culture work that they actually reduce cellular senescence. So the next step 
obviously should be to test them in clinical trials. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with clinical trials, and we're not there yet with the with the visa DAO compounds, but hopefully we'll get there soon. So the first trial is uh, I'm I'm only going to talk about the ICON trial today. It's a double-blinded RCT where we uh, wanted to target chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so these are smokers lung with, with NR. And so why is this interesting? So we know that, this is some of my old work when I was a postdoc, that DNA damage can drive loss of NAD and uh, premature aging. And so you can, uh, and this is driven largely probably by the DNA damage response driven by an enzyme called PARP1, which consumes NAD and then leads to loss of NAD. And so you can replenish NAD, which I'm sure you all know, with this compound called NR, nicotinamide riboside. So we thought that uh, this would be a very interesting uh, potential avenue for treating um, COPD. Because when you smoke, you induce DNA damage, you induce inflammatory responses in, in the lung. And so we, uh, we wanted to test whether or not NR could could do something about this. And so we, uh, we designed a trial with, uh, with 40 COPD patients in stable conditions. We also have 20, uh, um, we had to exclude two, so 18 controls. And then they were randomized to either NR or placebo. Uh, and obviously everybody was blinded. And then we then looked at how that affected the outcome. And so the first uh, take here is that individuals with, with the COPD have less, uh, slightly less NR in their circulation. And the level of, uh, not NR, NAD in the circulation. And the level of NAD in the circulation actually correlates with their lung function. So um, when you give NR, our primary outcome measures was uh, uh, IL-8, and that's because IL-8 is um, likely causative in COPD, and it's also uh, um, known to be induced, for example, by SASP. And so what we found was that NR actually significantly reduced um, IL-8 in these patients, and um, the, um, the effect on IL-8 was, was, uh, was dependent also on the, 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 the pre-treatment IL-8 levels. So that means that the, the, the individuals that ha had the highest inflammatory load was also the individuals that had the strongest effect. And then we saw less recruitment of neutrophils to the lung. And these are involved in, in generating some of the um, inflammatory response in the lung that is uh, likely not beneficial for COPD patients. Because we have these sputum samples, which is basically you know, these individuals coughing up small uh, cells from their lower airways, we could then use our senescence predictor on these cells, and we see that, um, that NR appears to reduce the amount of uh, senescent cells in, in, the, in the sputum of these patients. We can also look at the transcriptional changes that occur in the uh, airways in the patients. And so here we did, we did RNA-seq on nasal brushes. And um, we saw a strong reduction in inflammatory responses with NR in the COVD, but, but also in the action of the healthy controls. Okay, so it appears that NR reduces airway senescence and inflammation in COVD patients. Okay, so uh, just to sum up everything, we have, uh, we have a lot of biomarkers of aging. I think we have enough to actually start doing clinical trials. We have interventions that can be used in humans, and we have shown, and others have shown, that we can impact biomarkers of aging with interventions. So I think the last thing that's really missing, and uh, that will, I think, make the clinical community actually listen to us, is to, to show that we can also impact morbidity, disease development, mortality. And I think this is really the critical key. Earlier, I think Todd again mentioned that 14% of the 
healthcare individuals didn't know about longevity medicine. And the reason I think they don't know about longevity medicine is because we haven't shown that anything works. So once we show that something works, then I think they will listen. And with that, I'm just going to stop. And this is the team, uh, some collaborators now funding. Thank you so much.